Hi there, my name is Gareth Crispin and I'm a lecturer in practical theology here at Cliff College and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session just spending a few minutes thinking about intergenerational church, thinking whether it's a fashion or whether it's something that's here to stay. Will we be talking about it in 10 years time? Well hopefully with the questions that we're going to be thinking about today uh, we'll help to see why we should be thinking about it at least in 10 years time. We're going to address three questions today. What is intergenerationality? Why is it important? And why might it be difficult? What is intergenerational church? As with a lot of terms we throw around, uh, there's different definitions, different people mean different things by the term. But when you read in the literature that's written around intergenerationality, there is a very specific technical meaning to the word. And it is important uh, that we dwell on it just for a second. Uh, Holly Cadston Allen and Christina Ross have written what has become a seminal text in intergenerational uh, ministry and church, intergenerational Christian formation, published by IVP in 2012. And their definition of IG is this it's when a congregation intentionally brings the generations together in mutual serving, sharing, or learning within the core activities of the church in order to live out being the body of Christ to each other and the greater community. You'll notice here a stress on several things. One is this idea of mutuality and this idea of sharing, learning together and living out the body of Christ, living out what it means to be the church. These are some of the key elements of intergenerationality. Um, Alan Harkness, an intergenerational thinker, uh, breaks it down into four what he calls constituency factors mutuality, collaboration, shared experiences, and bi-directional teaching. And you'll see there's a bit more detail in terms of what he's talking about there, but it's commensurate with Alan Ross's definition. There's a stress on mutuality, collaboration, working together, shared experiences, bi-directional teaching, this idea that it's not simply about one way, but adults might have as much to learn from children as vice versa. At this point, we'll make a distinction between intergenerationality and multi-generationality. It's an important distinction. Intergenerationality would look like this. Uh, the size of the dot correlates to the age of the person. But there's arrows going both way. And it's quite, not chaotic, but dispersed, fragmented and organic. There's bi-directional teaching, there's mutuality, there's a the hierarchy. This is really at the core of what people are trying to get at when they talk about intergenerationality. Multi-generationality, on the other hand, would be all ages present, um, but not interacting. No participation, collaboration, mutuality. There would be one person uh, up the front talking to all of those ages. Now, in a classic all age service that a lot of you will be familiar with, you'll note that actually people often flip between multi-generational and intergenerational moments within that time, some stressing multi-generationality, some stressing intergenerationality, and maybe some of the reasons why will become apparent as we go through the rest of the presentation. But that's helpful to break down what we mean by intergenerationality and multi-generationality. Our second question is, why is intergenerationality important? Why is it an important thing? Why is everyone talking about it? Or at least why ought some people who aren't talking about it really ought to talk about it? The first point I want to talk about is embodying the gospel. IG is important because it's one of those aspects of church life which demonstrates what the gospel is. It's one of those ways in which we live out who God made us to be. Now, the same could be applied to uh, other distinctions within uh, humanity, for example, racial distinctions, gender distinctions. Um, but we embody the gospel by showing how united the body of Christ is in its essence. So Galatians 3.28, uh, the oft quoted uh, verse, there is no, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, uh, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, age isn't one of those uh, categories, uh, but you could start putting other categories in there quite understandable, couldn't you? It's not an exhaustive list, it's illustrative. So it could be black or white, it could be old or young. It's really who we're supposed to be. And so being IG is really important. 
Sharon Ketchum Galgai, another intergenerational writer, puts it this way. Intergenerationality is not an ideal or an aim. Others might argue that it is those things as well. But her main concern is that it's a truth about the very essence of the church. I know there's big discussions around what is the essence of the church. Um, but for IG thinkers, intergenerationality, that uh, mutuality, that collaboration, that bi-directional teaching embodies the gospel. It demonstrates what the church is supposed to be, at least in part. The next reason I want to think about why IG is important is its missional significance. Um, historically, of course, uh, age segregation or segmentation has been uh, a missional response. But actually, people are starting to think of the missional significance of intergenerationality. There's some very detailed practical reasons why that's the case, but I just want to think of two more principled reasons. Uh, the first is the idea of reconciliation, which is picked up by Mount Stephen and Martin in their little growth booklet, The Body Beautiful, where they say the call of the church is to model reconciled community, not as a displacement activity to avoid the real task of mission, but because reconciliation lies at the very heart of mission. So they're saying it's not so much that we should work on being all together for all ages, simply because it's something that we ought to do alongside the core activity of mission, but actually it's at the very heart of mission because it's an example of reconciliation that's related to what we've already talked about in Galatians 3 as well, of course. There is some missional significance, argue Mount Stephen and Martin. But also it's missionally significant because Gen Z are a co-creating uh, culture. Uh, so this idea uh, that uh, we used to consume stuff um, that other people were producing without much uh, contribution, we could choose to consume this or that, but we wouldn't contribute to it, is giving way to a culture where people are starting to actually interact with the things that they're consuming. So if you think about various apps that people might use on social media, uh, it's to, particularly TikTok, which is a really interesting example. There's a way in which people are creating stuff and then other people are taking what's created and uh, taking that on and creating more things with those things. Um, and that's a very familiar thing to Gen Z. They're a co-creating uh, culture. It's a participative culture, much more so than when Gen X certainly uh, were growing up. And so it's mutually significant because that's how Gen Z uh, live, if we want to contextualise, that's something we ought to think about. IG is also important because of faith retention. Uh, Litch is a sociologist of religion, and uh, her study of three church congregations, which wasn't a theological study, was squarely a sociological study, um, found something very interesting. She found this. In affirming that parents are the most influential factor in faith transmission, uh, another conversation for another time, perhaps, the importance of parents, Litch's study showed that they are so because of how they link their teens to the churches, which is the primary place where they develop religious commitment through socialization and religious experience. So Litch is saying parents are important, but actually they're important because of the connection that they make with the wider church. So IG is important for faith retention as well. And there's plenty of other surveys and studies that we could go to, like the Anglican study rooted in the church or the Sticky Faith Project to draw on that. But why might IG be difficult? We know what it is, we know that it's important, but why isn't it happening more? Or if we want to go about thinking about implementing IG or even multi-generationality at least in our churches, uh, what might be stopping us? Why might it be difficult? It's worth pausing uh, to think about the obstacles that we might face. These will be different, of course, depending on uh, the churches involved. But common to all will be social fragmentation. Uh, beginning right back with the Renaissance and Reformation and Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution, society became more and more fragmented, moving from a time where children and young people would grow up in a, uh, a cottage where their uh, parents would farm and produce local uh, produce, and they would be educated, uh, healed, uh, taught, uh, everything apprenticed within the home. Uh, you lead from that to a situation where uh, youth and children are outside of the home for education, outside of the home for 
hospital treatment, outside of the home for religious instruction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Society becomes very fragmented um, instead of a, a common canon of culture where everyone knows about the references you're making. Suddenly culture is ultimately uh, dispersed and fragmented. So many uh, channels, so many apps, so many popular cultural references uh, that there isn't one cohesive uh, story that's being told. And in the wake of social fragmentation, churches end up um, missionally often, or sometimes not, sometimes unthinkingly for discipleship purposes, um, following a society which has become uh, fragmented. Um, Thomas Berger in his very excellent, his excellent book, uh, The Juvenilization uh, of American Christianity, uh, writes this about that, that, that process. Uh, crowded together, this is a reference to schools, crowded together in age-segregated environments to learn how to be productive adults. That's his reference to the Industrial Revolution. Young people instead became, began to create their own language, values and styles, which sociologist Talcott Parsons would soon label youth culture. What he's saying is, is that uh, it, the idea of, of solving the problem of youth uh, by putting them into schools which are age-segmented uh, and obviously around the turn of the last century, becoming older and older, the children worked before they left school, um, in order to create a society which had young people who could work in the factories and, and, and become soldiers and defend uh, the country. Uh, that kind of started to backfire as instead of uh, producing the adults they wanted, young people started to take uh, matters into their own hands and creating this thing called youth culture, which adults weren't uh, in control of. And it was in this environment that churches began uh, to segment in their ministries, as I said, both as a missional imperative, a kind of contextualization, but also a response within the churches for discipleship, the creation of, um, if you like, uh, mimicking Sunday schools, uh, um, which used to be something outside of the church, uh, mimicking those inside the church, which became more and more um, uh, something that happened in the late 19th and, and in the 20th century, uh, culminating in what uh, some people have talked about uh, or described as the one-eared Mickey Mouse, where the church uh, is here and the youth and children are off to the side um, in their own groups, their peer groups, they're segmented along age lines groups uh, and distanced from uh, the church. So the reason that this is difficult in the first instance, it's, it's very much rooted in our society. Social fragmentation, uh, fragmentation along age lines has been long uh, since woven into the fabric of our society, uh, our media, uh, our industry, our education, everything, uh, such that it's just become uh, a way of life. However, there are other reasons why intergenerationality might be difficult. Not only are we working against the grain of society, we're also uh, potentially, not always, but potentially dealing with theological issues uh, that might work against intergenerationality. This is, of course, where we get controversial. Um, and I want to say right up front, simply because a certain theology may or may not help with IG, that doesn't mean that you should or shouldn't adopt it. Of course, we should think about theology uh, in a much, uh, much purer way than that. Uh, our theology should be driven by pragmatics and expediency. We should think about whether it's right or not, whether it's true or not, whether it stacks up to scripture uh, or not. But certainly in research that I've done, um, theological categories such as trinity, spirit, creation, sin, uh, and also the philosophical foundations beneath theology all play into this question of is intergenerationally difficult or not. Uh, for example, um, those that embrace intergenerationality uh, often embrace a social Trinitarian model. Uh, I don't personally agree with that, um, but it is interesting if you're thinking about implementing IG to think, hmm, is there something about our doctrine of Trinity that makes this difficult? I'm again not saying you should change your doctrine of Trinity on the basis of that, but it is useful at least to know uh, what might be some of the issues that you're facing. Same with spirit and creation. Um, if uh, your theology is one where the spirit is very much bound to the church and the Bible, maybe in a conservative evangelical uh, um, example, uh, then the idea uh, that a youth and child might um, express a truth about the Christian faith becomes something you're less comfortable with. Um, equally, the idea of creation, where um, actually, you know, the, the, all of the light is here in the church um, and that there's less good stuff out there. Linking to this point about sin um, outside of the church is, is sinful. There's less grace out there. If that's an approach, then again, um, IGB starts to become problematic. Uh, and those sorts of churches sometimes at least uh, want to hold on to an idea 
of an authoritative teaching from a trained person being a much safer way to go. And some of this also points to underlying philosophical foundations um, around um, whether uh, you're left-leaning or right-leaning uh, politically, philosophically, um, also whether you embrace post-modernity or modernity. Um, and these are issues which uh, obviously require a significant amount of thinking to do. But when you paint a picture of a church that takes a certain view of Trinity, spirit and creation, and sin has certain underlying philosophical foundations, um, actually it starts to uh, become apparent quite obviously why IG might be difficult, especially when we start to think about that idea of mutuality, this idea of bi-directional teaching, which is a much flatter, relational, social interactive idea, which aligns obviously with certain theologies rather than others. Lastly, leadership is really important as well. The theology of the leader, you know, is the leader an authoritative pastor teacher who leads through teaching, or is the leader a curator of an experience? Uh, is it a flat structure? Is it a hierarchical? Which taps into what we thought about before, but it's specifically a question about leadership. Is the leader leading the sheep in front, or are they in amongst the sheep, finding out where the sheep want to go? What about the background of the leader? In the research that I've done, uh, this is a striking factor in whether IG is difficult or not. Uh, if a leader has never really seen IG in operation and had an experience where peer groups were, where the action was at, if you like, then that is what they go with when they grow up uh, into uh, ministry and take on a leadership role. Similarly, stage of life. Uh, those who have young children are very attentive to the experience of young children in mission and ministry. Those with teenage children are very attentive to teenage children. And so that comes into play into this as well. But also personality. Some personalities lend themselves to IG uh, more than others. Again, these are um, complicated issues that require some unpicking and some thinking, but there's certainly some things to think about when thinking why IG might be difficult. So we thought about what IG is. There's a focus around mutuality and including all ages. And we thought about um, why it's important. And we thought about why it might be difficult. I'll leave you to think about whether it's a fad or a fashion, and hopefully you will be thinking about it in 10 years time and it will prove to be more enduring than that. Thank you very much.